Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu given up on peace and should the rest of the world give up on a two-state solution as long as he remains in power? Joining me to debate this is the author of The War on the West, Douglas Murray, and the Palestinian National Initiative leader. In a recent interview, Piers Morgan sparked a heated debate with the provocative question. Has Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu abandoned the two-state solution by aligning with hardliners in his party? And should the rest of the world give up on the two-state solution as long as he remains in power? To explore this issue, he brought together Douglas Murray, author of The War of the West, and Mustafa Bargaudi, leader of the Palestinian National Initiative. Well, my reaction is that Mr. Regev speaks about Palestinians have to give up. Give up what? I don't understand. And he wants uh, peace. He wants security without ending the Israeli occupation. He ignores the basic facts, which is that Israel has conducted ethnic cleansing against 70% of the Palestinian people. Morgan began with Bargaudi, seeking his response to a previous interview. Bargaudi passionately criticized Mark Regev's stance and Israeli policies, accusing them of ethnic cleansing and maintaining a prolonged occupation of Palestinian territories. Israel wants peace and security without ending the occupation, Bargaudi argued highlighting ongoing Palestinian suppression and violence. A very wise Jewish man uh, by the name of Albert Einstein, Einstein said, some, said something very wise. He said, it is absolutely ins it is insanity to keep repeating the same thing and expect different results. Well, actually, Israel uh, thing actually, I can tell you he didn't actually say that. Quick to fact check. Morgan corrected a misattributed quote before turning to Douglas Murray for his perspective. Morgan acknowledged Murray's strong support for Israel while also respecting his stance. However, he raised concerns about the recent withdrawal of support from Israel's allies and its potential implications. Well, I think the Israeli government knows better than most people, certainly most pundits, about how it might end. Um, I think that there are several things I have to say in reply to Mr. Barghouti, by the way. First of all, when I was on this show last with Mr. Barghouti... Murray responded in positive terms, expressing confidence in Israel's understanding of the situation compared to pundits at large in all sorts of mass media forums. He also countered Barghouti's claims and outlined Israeli reluctance, even among left-wing factions, to discuss a two-state solution currently. To Murray, the timing was bad enough, especially if you consider the recent attacks. Firstly, on the question of the West Bank, I uh, think frankly, you're in this Israel, question. there are very few people, uh, very few people in Israel who believe that even if you can have a two-state solution, now is a good time to talk about it. Murray then expanded on security concerns in the West Bank, emphasizing Israeli caution due to past challenges in Gaza. In short, Israel couldn't allow a two-state solution because the West Bank, like Gaza, was a potential hotspot. Murray buttressed his stance by criticizing international misconceptions about the Palestinian Authority, citing corruption and external funding as significant issues. Absolutely rubbish. Absolutely rubbish. Bargaudi responded passionately by first indicating that in all fairness, he was unequally yoked in this debate with Murray, who was extremely pro-Israeli. As far as he was concerned, fairness means giving adequate time to present contrasting views, not just repeating Israeli propaganda. And in his opinion, what Murray said was absolute rubbish, perpetuating falsehoods without verifying facts. I don't agree with him totally. And he is repeating the same aggressive and fascist speech. They don't want to state, <laughs> what do they want to do with the 7 million people? Palestinian, 7 million Palestinians. Valgadi now insisted on addressing the aggressive and fascist rhetoric, as he put it. If Israel rejects a two-state solution, then what's their plan for the 7 million Palestinians in historic Palestine? He asked. If not two states, then a single democratic state with equal rights for all is the only fair solution. But Netanyahu and his government, who openly embrace fascist ideologies, show no interest in either. Democratic state, so their solution is exactly what they are trying to do in Gaza now, which is genocide and ethnic cleansing. Genocide. It is genocide what's happening, because we are talking about 32,000 Palestinian people killed including those under the rubble, and 64,000 people injured, 63,000 people injured. That is 4% of the population. Bargaudi added, their approach mirrors the tragic situation unfolding in Gaza, genocide and ethnic cleansing. It's genocide, 
as far as 32,000 Palestinians have been killed and 64,000 injured, with amounts to 4% of the population. If this happened in the US, it would mean 12 million lives affected. Is that acceptable? And don't forget the occupation of the West Bank. Is the US also condoning that? Douglas, Sir, Sir Ephraim Mervis, the UK's chief rabbi, has said that using the word genocide to describe Israel's actions in Gaza is an increasingly frequent disingenuous misappropriation of the term. He said the use of the term was a moral inversion which undermines the memory of the worst crimes in human history and designed to tear open the still gaping wounds of the Holocaust. Murray intervened, citing the UK's chief rabbi's perspective on genocide. Simply put, this rabbi had suggested that what was happening in Gaza paled in comparison to the Holocaust. But indeed, it was no justification for it or for him to qualify it in that way. But then Murray accused Mr. Baghdadi of being an apologist for terrorists. He then cited the Palestinian Prisoners Law of 2004, signed by Mohammed Abbas, which mandates involved in anti-occupation activities. And I'm quoting Article 2 here. Prisoners, anyone incarcerated in the occupation's prisons for his participation in the struggle against the occupation will terrorists. be given a salary by the, by the pal Let me finish my point. They are will freedom be given fighters. a salary by the Palestinian Authority. Persisting with his argument, Murray pointed out how in 2018 alone, the Palestinian Authority allocated $162 million to prisoners and released prisoners, with an additional $13 million to families of martyrs. As far as Murray was concerned, this wasn't about freedom fighting. It all amounted to state support incentivization. But Bargatti responded, countering Murray's assertion by saying that the disbursement helped with social security. 90% of the Palestinian Authority budget comes from taxpayers, from Palestinian people. And only 10% comes from and the Israeli aid. government. Contra and contrary to, no, 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 no. And Israel is by connect, com committing piracy, stealing our taxpayers' money. Preventing health education. Apparently, 90% of Palestinian Authority's budget comes from Palestinian taxpayers themselves. Only a small fraction, 10%, comes from external sources. But what was more concerning is Israel's interception of Palestinian tax revenues, disrupting essential services like healthcare and education by withholding salaries. So essentially, the Israeli government was indiscriminately making life difficult for all Palestinians. If people are occupied, what does international law say? International says law, say, law says that people who are under occupation have the right to struggle against their occupiers. No, no, using no, it forms. doesn't. No, no, it no, doesn't. no, that's what the UN says. You can't de deviate. At this point, Bargadi went so far as to accuse Murray sharply for interrupting and trying to steer the discussion away. But the crew of the matter remained the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories. And according to international law, those under occupation have the right to resist. Moreover, since 1967, Israel has conducted over a million arrests among the 7 million Palestinians in the region. How could that even be justified? Mr. Barghouti doesn't want a two-state solution because he doesn't want a Jewish state. He wants the river That's to the sea true. to be a Palestinian state, ruled by him and his corrupt friends. But secondly, he cannot answer the question I've put to him repeatedly. I this is the, the PA budget. It rewards terrorism. In the throes of the argument, Murray addressed two key points, stating that Mr. Barghouti appeared to oppose a two-state solution due to his rejection of a Jewish state's existence. Murray faulted Bargadi's vision of Palestinian control over the entire region, which raises serious governance and stability concerns. Secondly, Murray pointed out that Bargadi had so far not addressed the issue of PA funds allegedly rewarding terrorism. And the, the, the main fact here is that the problem we have is that Israel is occupying Palestinian land and Israel is oppressing Palestinian people. Since 1967, Israel conducted one million arrests against the seven million people who are living there. How could this be acceptable? Okay, what we see here let is the- So, Bargadi interjected. By defending the Palestinian Authority, he insisted that the PA supports its people, including families affected by conflict. In the end, it was about their welfare amidst occupation and conflict. But Murray disagreed and stood his ground on his earlier assertion. To him, this approach of rewarding freedom fighters does not support peace negotiations. So, we would like to know your thoughts on this debate. In order to satisfy all sides in the impasse, what really is the way forward? Let us have your suggestions in the comments section below.